Despite the trouble with Ambrose, my obsession with the archives, and my countless fruitless trips to Imre hunting dinner, I managed to finish my project in the fishery. I would have liked another span of days to run a few more tests and tinker with it, but I was simply out of time. The admissions lottery was coming up soon and my tuition would be due not long after. Before I could put my project up for sale, I needed Kilvin to approve my design. So it was with no small amount of trepidation that I knocked on the door of Kilvin's office. The master artificer was hunched over his personal work table, carefully removing the screws from the bronze casing of a compression pump. He didn't look up as he spoke. Yes, Rilar Quoth. I'm finished, Master Kilvin, I said simply. He looked up at me, blinking. How do you know? Yes, I was hoping to make an appointment so I might demonstrate it to you. Kilvin set the screws in a tray and brushed his hands together. For this I am available now. I nodded and led the way through the busy workshop, fast stocks to the private workroom Kilvin had assigned me. I brought out the key and unlocked the heavy timber door. It was large, as workrooms go, with its own firewell, anvil, fume hood, drench, and other assorted staples of the artificing trade. I'd pushed the work table aside to leave half of the room empty except for several thick bales of straw stacked against the wall. Hanging from the ceiling in front of the bales was a crude scarecrow. I dressed it in my burned shirt and a pair of sackcloth pants. Part of me wished I'd run a few more tests in the time it had taken to sew the pants and stuff the straw man. But at the end of the day, I'm a trooper first and all else second. As such, I couldn't ignore the chance for a little showmanship. I closed the door behind us while Kilvin looked around the room curiously. Deciding to let my work speak for itself, I brought out the crossbow and handed it to him. The huge master's expression went dark. Rilar Quoth, he said, his voice heavy with disapproval. Tell me you have not squandered the labor of your hands on the improvement of such a beastly thing. Trust me, Master Kilvin, I said, holding it out to him. He gave me a long look, then took the crossbow and began to examine it with the meticulous care of a man who spent every day working with deadly equipment. He fingered the tightly woven string and eyed the curved metal arm of the bow. After several long minutes, he nodded, put one foot through the stirrup and cocked it without any noticeable effort. Idly, I wondered how strong Kilvin was. My shoulders ached and my hands were blistered from struggling with the unwieldy thing over the last several days. I handed him the heavy bolt and he examined it as well. I could see him looking increasingly perplexed. I knew why. The bow didn't have any obvious modifications or sigildry. Neither did the bolt. Kilvin slotted the bolt into the crossbow and raised an eyebrow at me. I made an expansive gesture to the straw man, trying to look more confident than I felt. My hands were sweating and my stomach was full of doves. Tests were fine and good, tests were important, tests were like rehearsal. But all that really matters is what happens when the audience is watching. This is a truth all troopers know. Kilvin shrugged and raised the crossbow. It looked small, braced against his broad shoulder and he took a moment to carefully sight along the top of it. I was surprised to see him calmly draw half a breath and exhale slowly as he pulled the trigger. The crossbow jerked, the string twanged, the bolt blurred. There was a harsh metallic clank, and the bolt stopped midair, as if it had struck an invisible wall. It clattered to the stone floor in the middle of the room, fifteen feet away from the straw man. Unable to help myself, I laughed and threw my arms triumphantly into the air. Kilvin raised his eyebrows and looked at me. I grinned, a manic grin. The master retrieved the bolt from the floor and examined it again. Then he recocked the crossbow, sighted, and pulled the trigger. Clank! The bolt dropped to the floor a second time, skittering slightly to one side. This time Kilvin spotted the source of the noise. Hanging from the ceiling in the far corner of the room was a metal object the size of a large lantern. It was rocking back and forth and spinning slightly as if someone had just struck it a glancing blow. I took it off its hook 
and brought it back to where Master Kilvin waited at the work table. What is this thing, Raylar Quoth? he said curiously. I set it down on the table with a heavy clunk. In general terms, Master Kilvin, it's an automatically triggered kinetic opposition device. I beamed proudly. More specifically, it stops arrows. Kilvin bent to look at it, but there was nothing to see except for featureless plates of dark iron. My creation looked like nothing so much as a large, eight-sided lantern made entirely of metal. And what do you call it? That was the one part of my invention I hadn't managed to finish. I'd thought of a hundred names, but none of them seemed to fit. Arrow Trap was pedestrian, the Traveler's Friend was prosaic, Bandit Bane was ridiculously melodramatic. I could never have looked Kilvin in the eye again if I tried to call it that. I'm having some trouble with the name, I admitted, but for now I'm calling it an arrow catch. <sighs> Kilvin grunted. It does not catch the arrow precisely. I know, I said exasperated, but it was either that or call it a clank. Kilvin looked at me sideways, his eyes smiling a little. One would think a student of Elodin's would prove more facile with his naming, Relar Quoth. Delivari had it easy, Master Kilvin, I said. He just made a better axle and stuck his name on it. I can't very well call this the Quoth. Kilvin chuckled. <laughs> True. He turned back to the arrow catch, eyeing it curiously. How does it work? I grinned and brought out a large roll of paper covered in diagrams, complicated sigildry, metallurgical symbols, and painstaking formulae for kinetic conversion. There are two main parts, I said. The first is the sigildry that automatically forms a sympathetic link with any thin, fast-moving piece of metal within twenty feet. I don't mind telling you, that took me a long couple of days to figure out. I tapped the appropriate runes on the piece of paper. At first I thought that might be enough by itself, I hoped if I bound an incoming arrowhead to a stationary piece of iron, it would absorb the arrow's momentum and make it harmless. Kilvin shook his head. It has been tried before. I should have realized before I even tried, I said. At best, it only absorbs a third of the arrow's momentum, and any one two-thirds arrow shot is still going to be in a bad way. I gestured to a different diagram. What I really needed was something that could push back against the arrow and it had to push very fast and very hard. I ended up using the spring steel from a bear trap, modified, of course. I picked up a spare arrowhead from the work table and pretended it was moving toward the arrow catch. First, the arrow comes close and establishes the binding. Second, the incoming arrow's momentum sets off the trigger just like stepping on a trap. I snapped my fingers sharply. Then the spring's stored energy pushes back at the arrow, stopping it or even knocking it backward. Kilvin was nodding along. If it needs to be reset after each use, how did it stop my second bolt? I pointed to the central diagram. This wouldn't be of much use if it only stopped one arrow, I said, or if it only stopped arrows coming from one direction. I designed it to have eight springs in a circle. It should be able to stop arrows from several directions at once. I shrugged apologetically. In theory. I haven't been able to test that. Kilvin looked back at the straw man. Both of my shots came from the same direction, he said. How was the second one stopped if that spring had already been triggered? I picked up the arrow catch by the ring I'd set into the top and showed how it could rotate freely. It hangs on a pivot ring, I said. The shock of the first arrow set it spinning slightly, which brought a new spring into alignment. Even if it hadn't, the energy of the incoming arrow tends to swing it around to the nearest untriggered spring, like a weather vane points into the wind. I hadn't actually planned the last. It had been a lucky accident, but I didn't see any reason to tell Kilvin that. I touched the red dots visible on two of the eight iron faces of the arrow catch. These show which springs have been triggered. Kilvin took it from me and turned it in his hands. How do you reset the springs? I slid a metal device out from under the work table, little more than a piece of iron with a long lever attached. Then I showed Kilvin the eight-sided hole in the bottom of the arrow catch. I fitted the arrow catch onto the device and pressed down on the lever with my foot until I heard a sharp click. Then I rotated the arrow catch and repeated the process. Kilvin bent to pick it up and turned it over in his huge hands. 
Heavy, he commented. It needed to be sturdy, I said. A crossbow bolt can punch through a two-inch oak plank. I needed the spring to snap back with at least three times that much force to stop the arrow. Kilvin shook the arrow catch idly, holding it to the side of his head. It didn't make any noise. And what if the arrowheads are not made of metal? He asked. These Simbi raiders are said to use arrows of flint or obsidian. I looked down at my hands and sighed. Well, I said slowly, if the arrowheads aren't some sort of iron, the arrow catch wouldn't trigger when they came within twenty feet. Kilvin gave a non-committal grunt and set the arrow catch back down on the table with a thump. But, I said brightly, when it came within fifteen feet, any piece of sharp stone or glass would trigger a different set of bindings. I tapped my schema. I was proud of it, as I'd also had the foresight to inscribe the inset pieces of obsidian with the sigildry for twice-tough glass. That way, they wouldn't shatter under the impact. Kilvin glanced at the schema, then grinned proudly and chuckled deep in his chest. <laughs> good, good. What if the arrow has a head of bone or ivory? The runes for bone aren't trusted to a lowly railer like myself, I said. And if they were? Kilvin asked. Then I still wouldn't use them, I said. Lest some child doing a cartwheel trigger the arrow catch with a thin, quickly moving piece of their skull. Kilvin nodded his approval. I was thinking of a galloping horse, he said. But you show your wisdom in this. You show you have the careful mind of an artificer. I turned back to the schemer and pointed. That said, Master Kilvin, at ten feet, a fast-moving cylindrical piece of wood will trigger the arrow catch. I sighed. It's not a good link, but it's enough to stop the arrow, or at least deflect it. Kilvin bent to examine the schema more closely his eyes wandering the crowded page for a long couple of minutes. All iron? he asked. Closer to steel, Master Kilvin. I worried iron would be too brittle in the long term. On each of these eighteen bindings are inscribed on each of the springs? he asked, gesturing. I nodded. That is a great duplication of effort, Kilvin said his tone more conversational than accusatory. Some might say such a thing is overbuilt. I care very little what other people think, Master Kilvin, I said. Only what you think. He grunted, then looked up from the paper and turned to face me. I have four questions, I nodded expectantly. First, of all things, why make this? He asked. No one should ever die from ambush on the road, I said firmly. Kilvin waited, but I had nothing more to say on the matter. After a moment, he shrugged and gestured to the other side of the room. Second, where did you get the... His brow furrowed slightly. David Bim, the flat bore. My stomach clenched at the question. I'd held the vain hope that Kilvin being Kaldish wouldn't know such things were illegal here in the Commonwealth. Barring that, I'd hoped he simply wouldn't ask. I, um, procured it, Master Kilvin, I said evasively. I needed it to test the arrow catch. Why not use a simple hunter's bow, Kilvin said sternly, and thereby avoid the need of illegal procurement. It would be too weak, Master Kilvin. I needed to be sure my design would stop any arrow and a crossbow fires a bolt harder than any other. A Madigan longbow is equal of a flatbow, Kilvin said. But the use of one is beyond my skill, I said, and the purchase of a Madigan bow is far beyond my means. Kilvin let out a deep sigh. Ugh. Before, when you made your thief's lamp, you made a bad thing in a good way. That I do not like. He looked down at the schema. This time... You have made a good thing in a bad way. That is better, but not entirely. Best is to make a good thing in a good way. Agreed? I nodded. 
He lay one massive hand on the crossbow. Did anyone see you with it? I shook my head. Then we will say it is mine, and you procured it under my advisement. It will join the equipment in stocks. He gave me a hard look. And in the future, you will come to me if you need such things. That stung a bit, as I'd been planning on selling it back to Sleet. Still, it could have been worse. The last thing I wanted was to run afoul of the Iron Law. Third, I see no mention of gold wire or silver in your schema, he said. Nor can I imagine any use they could be put to in such a device as yours. Explain why you have checked these materials out of stocks. I was suddenly pointedly aware of the cool metal of my gram against the inside of my arm. Its inlay was gold, but I could hardly tell him that. I was short on money, Master Kilvin, and I needed materials I couldn't get in stocks. Such as your flatbow? I nodded. And the straw and the bear traps. Wrong follows wrong, Kilvin said disapprovingly. The stocks are not a moneylender's stall and should not be used as such. I am rescinding your precious metals authorization. I bowed my head, hoping I looked appropriately chastised. You will also work twenty hours in stocks as your punishment. If anyone asks, you will tell them what you did, and explain that as a punishment you were forced to repay the value of the metals plus an additional twenty per cent. If you use stocks as a money lender, you will be charged interest like a money lender. I winced at that. Yes, Master Kilvin. Last, Kilvin said, turning to lay one huge hand on the arrow catch. What do you imagine such a thing would sell for, Rilar? Quoth. My heart rose in my chest. Does that mean you approve it for sale, Master Kilvin? The great bear-like artificer gave me a puzzled look. Of course I approve it, Rilar, quoth. It is a wondrous thing. It's an improvement to the world. Every time a person sees such a thing, they will see how artificery is used to keep men safe. They will think well of all artificers for the making of such a thing.